Hello and good afternoon and welcome to this, um, the uh, Tate sponsored webinar. Um, <clears throat> my name is, is Ian and I'm gonna, gonna share some thoughts with you this afternoon about leadership and about leadership development and just how that, uh, how that currently works in the world that we're part of. Um, ever since, uh, you know, I was going to say almost the beginning of time, but certainly the idea of leadership came into uh, came into being as a subject that we could study um, officially back in, in 1892 um, at St Andrews University when uh, a lecture was given about uh, how to influence other human beings, the art <coughs> and the science of of leading people and so it's been a fascination and a curiosity uh, ever since so i'm going to share over the next half an hour some slides some thoughts and simply uh have a little bit of a, a q a session at the end around some of the things that we we as leaders uh can explore and, and talk to you about what that might look like um, if you've got any questions for me, then as you'll see, for those of you who are uh, a frequent Zoom webinar attendees, and, and normally at this stage in lockdown, most people seem to be, is that you'll see that there is a uh, a Q and A Q and A function down towards the bottom of your screen. So if you've if you've got a question for me uh, as we go through, or you'd like to raise something, feel free to do that. Um, if you've just got a general comment, or you'd like to say hello to any of the other people on this webinar then please feel free to uh to use the chat box which depending on how big you've got your screen open very often the the chat box is either on the left hand side or you have to click those three little buttons that say more in order to do that but if you want to share something with me and you want me to answer a question then i'd love to be able to do that and um and what I'd like you to do is just uh, answer that question um, and answer, ask that question and I will answer it. Um, if you don't get a chance to join this, then obviously, you know, feel free. You will have uh, an email from me, a follow up email that just says thank you. And so my email address will be in there. But also for those of you that want to, then feel free to, you know, to do the usual thing and connect on LinkedIn and send us a message if you have a question that you would uh, like to ask um outside of this forum so i'm going to share some slides with you and and just simply talk you through um a few ideas around leading and certainly leading leading teams and people and the ideas of leadership and, and how that occurs for us right now because i'm sure you're aware there are some challenges but actually there are also some solutions and we're going to talk on that we're going to touch on that and we're going to explore those as we as we move forward so without further ado um i will get started and i will share some some stuff with you and we shall take a look and go on a journey looking at leadership through a slightly different lens. So leadership through a slightly different lens, or could possibly, depending on, on when the last time you had any formal leadership training, it could be a significantly different lens, actually. But we're going to explore what leadership in this world looks like. And there is a model that's been around uh, for quite a while that fits very nicely now. And we've almost been, been sort of forced into exploring it and, and using it. So what I must do though, before I start, is just say a really big thank you to, uh, to Matthew Wicks or Matt, as some of you will know him, who is the operations manager at the Exeter office uh, for Tate. Matt has very kindly asked me to uh, asked me to do this and of course most of you have got a direct connection with Matt so um, it is to Matt's credit that he had the insight to ask me to do it and, and if you like what I've got to say I'm sure if you ask him again then there's some other things that we can do but if you get an opportunity then just please feel free drop Matt a message and you know and say thank you as, as Tate are quite innovative in what they do around creating opportunities like this and making sure that actually they they meet the needs of of the community that they support so leadership through a different lens um there are many different ways of defining leadership and we'll look at a couple of different ways as we go through um 
But one of the first things that we've got to be prepared to do when we want to be able to step forward and to think about leading and taking charge of other people. And do we actually ever really these days take charge of other people or are we influencing them and supporting them and encouraging them to, to think about the world in different ways and to inspire them? But actually what we've got to do sometimes, no matter how small or how large, is we've got to create the opportunity to simply step out from the crowd is to put our head above the parapet and want to be counted. There is the old adage, isn't it? For all those people, if you were to ask a thousand people how many of them wanted to be able to initiate some form of change in their life, then very often, you know, or want things to be better, then you'd have a thousand people simply put their hand in the air. But of course, if you ask people now, well, who's prepared to step forward, to step out of the crowd, to be able to initiate that? And sometimes there are just fewer hands in the air. So when we step into this world of wanting to be a leader and we step into this world of, of wanting to explore how leadership can work and certainly in a different way at a different time, then the first thing we've got to do is simply be courageous enough and bold enough to, to want to step out of the crowd. So hopefully what I'll do over the course of the next half an hour is kind of, you know, is get you excited or whet your appetite to want to discover a little bit more about not only what I do, but possibly a mind for adventure and also possibly how Tate can support you on your journey. Discovery is the key because one of the things that really drives us as leaders and encourages us to step forward, to want to step out of the crowd to not necessarily want to be one of those individuals that just sits as, as part of the masses is curiosity. So discovery sits as a real heart, really at the heart of that. So to be curious about situations, to be curious about people, to be curious about yourself and what it is that you have to be able to bring to the world, to get excited about that, to be curious at times about the unknown. So discovery sits as a key part of that. So the world as we know it right now is a very interesting place. The world as we know it right now has been has becoming more volatile, more uncertain, more complex and more and having a greater degree of ambiguity for for many many years. And the VUCA model I'm sure as some of you are aware has been around about 30 years. And the VUCA model has been something that's been growing as a way and a lens of looking at how we can inspire and how we can look after people and how we can lead them in different ways. It's argued that in the year that I was born, 1971, then what data shows is that the average human being at that point in time was exposed to um, the equivalent of one newspaper, of, of inf one broadsheet newspaper of information a day. So that's not necessarily um, a lot. What we know these days as a result of everything from social media through to access to data through to the ability to go on the internet and so on and so forth is just that there are sources of information that are around us all the time. And so one of the things that has become really apparent that today, 49 years later, is that the average the average working adult these days is exposed to somewhere in the equivalent of a hundred broadsheets, a hundred newspapers worth of information a day. And so actually it, it becomes quite overwhelming for people and very often for the people we lead because there's so much data. What it does at times is, is create a relationship or a fear with, with the possibility that maybe we could get it wrong because we always just need a little bit more information and a little bit more information. And so our ability to be able to, to make decisions sometimes and, and our ability to be able to inspire people and lead people because actually information is not something that necessarily can be used in the vehicle to lead them in the same way that it once was. And so it's times where we need to start to think about looking at how we show up in the world in a different way that we need to take a different lens on how we absolutely lead people and support them through massive times of transition, through massive change. And when the information channels that they're using to be able to grow, to learn, to develop, for us to be able to inspire them is changing at such an incredible pace. 
So what that means is, is that we need to hone in on those things that really do make a difference. But we also need to sometimes possibly allow some of the conventional wisdom around leadership just to disappear and become a little bit fuzzy. So volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. I'm just going to share a few definitions with you. The world you know is likely to change rapidly and unpredictably. Well, if we've learned anything, certainly in 2020, then, then, then that has happened at pace, not only as a result of um, the global pandemic that we're all part of, but actually the impact on the economy, the fact that some people are going back to work, some people aren't, the nature of the way that we're working has completely changed. So the patterns and behaviours that people had that they previously used that that they felt always worked, some of them have just disappeared because actually people are thinking and feeling and responding in completely different ways. Complexity. And this is happening whether we like it or not. Where this is that our world is constantly becoming more complex. The things, our frames of reference, the way that we understand the world is totally changing. And I'm sure for those of you that employ people right now or are leading people, actually, there was a point in time where we had certain frames of reference around how people worked, where they showed up to work. But actually, all those things have changed quite quickly and changed quite rapidly. And certainly for some of the clients that I'm supporting right now, what they're finding is that, that some really great people who had a particular frame of reference, who felt as though they had the ability to inspire and connect with people, are possibly struggling right now um, because actually they've got to think about how to do it differently. And so, of course, if we always do what we've always done, we always get what we've always got. So flexibility and I want to discover and connect and get excited about the unknown is something certainly for us as a leader that allows us to be able to deal with the complexity of the world as it stands at the moment. Uncertainty, the, the inability to know everything. Actually, this is as a coach for people on their personal journey. Then this is one of the things that, that actually I and I'm sure some of the other coaches that are watching this will probably nod outrageously out loud at is that, that everybody wanting to know the answer to the question before they've even asked it. One of the things that becomes really powerful for us at this time and as we start to see people step into a place of becoming incredibly capable leaders is those that are the most confident to be able to deal with the unknown, to be able to explore the idea of uncertainty, to know that they have faith and confidence in order to be able to actually step into it. And whilst they might not have the answer to the question of how do I fix this problem, but what they do have the answer to the question is, is I'm okay and actually I can draw upon all of my experiences in life so far and actually I've got the confidence to go I might not know the answer but I'll work it out I will work hard to work it out and that allows someone to really take that step forward to take that step forward out of the crowd right now a lack of models and ambiguity simply creates this place of uncertainty. Sometimes ambiguity can cause a sense of overwhelm for us. Over time, in lots of the organisations that we've, we've, we've all worked in, is actually what we've done is grown to invest in trying to create some form of certainty. Well, actually, if we're certain about everything, then actually we're certain about what we're going to get paid. We're certain about how it's going to work. We're certain about our market growth, which then means that we can't actually exploit the situation. Because if we always do what we've always done, we always get what we've always got. And actually, one of the things that's rapidly occurring right now is people's models of understanding, how they observe the world, how they understand the world, are changing. And that's the, chain, that's the same for all of the people that we lead. So our ability to be able to, to ebb and flow, our ability to be able to flex and absorb their models of the world is something that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on in a, in a moment. So actually, knowledge is power. Um, but actually, knowledge is power in a very different way these days. Um, it's about knowing the fact that the world will change quickly. It's not about having the answer to the question. There is a, a great Zen proverb that, uh, that says those people who know things will be stuck in that place forever. The more you, you're prepared to forget, the less that you're prepared to know, then the more that you will connect with your own true wisdom. 
And actually, maybe we just need to think about knowledge in a different way. Maybe actually right now as a leader, as someone who is supporting other people or aspiring to be able to support other people in, in your journey, actually maybe that knowledge comes from, from having really strong relationships, is knowing them and their needs and knowing yourself and your needs rather than assuming that you know what it is that they want. So I, I'm just going to rattle through a few um, a few definitions um, and and I am sure um, at the moment I don't necessarily know how many of you are on the call but if if there was 20 or 30 people then if I was to ask all of you for at least one definition of leadership then you'd all give me one um, and it'd all be a little bit different there may be some common words but actually that very visceral way that we understand how we go about creating environments and cultures how we go about creating Majestic moments for teams and people and organizations to really excel is going to be very different for all sorts of organizations, for all sorts of people. So linguists refer to the word leadership at times as a dirty word. Um, and what they mean by that is a word that can have many multiple meanings and that even in a conversation between people having decided what we believe is a common meaning is that we still don't quite understand each other environment and culture are similar things whereas sometimes some very scientific terms like i don't know stereo phantasmoscope then actually it's a really specific definition so actually one of the things that's really important when we think about this idea of what leadership is is to be able to have some conversations so with the people that we lead and actually the people that are supporting us in leading them is that we understand what it is this is a relatively straightforward definition, and it implies that, that we have to motivate people to achieve a common goal. Um, what it doesn't necessarily do is talk about how, is talk about how, because we all know that there's some really awful and very incredibly awful ways of in trying to inspire people and get them to connect with being a better version of themselves. There is the tell rather than the sell, but there are times when the sell isn't necessarily going to be the right thing because of the nature of the environment, and there does need to be a bit of tell. So how do we create that ebb and flow? How do we create those relationships with, with the people that we're leading, that we're inspiring, that are part of our team and our organisation? Good leaders take people with them. Good leaders inspire people. They create people who have the ability to use their own initiative, to be able to connect with and, and find the courage to, for them to step out of the crowd. It is often said that the simplest job for any leader is to be able to create more leaders. It's to allow people to feel free to make a contribution. Very often, I work with lots of organisations who want to evolve and look at their leadership structures, and they, they have a natural resistance at times to want to be able to trust people. Or well, one of the things that COVID has very definitely done is it's really forced people to have to trust people because people are working from home. And actually what we're seeing is, is that their performance is way, way greater very often than actually what they do in the office because they feel trusted and they feel empowered. It's just unfortunate that the circumstances, that global circumstances have forced that people into that situation rather than necessarily leaders choosing to be able to do that in the first place. We use this idea, this phrase all the time, it gets used across lots of organisations, this idea of empowerment. And then we wonder why people don't seem to want to take up the challenge of, of being empowered. And very often it's because they don't feel trusted. And I'm going to touch on that in a, in a minute. So right now, I'm just going to simply ask you to have an open mind. I'm simply going to ask you to, to possibly just take a moment and, and think about leadership in a slightly different way. Because if we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always got. And many of us have spent years and years and years studying particular leadership models. Certainly I did, you know, from my time in the military and my time in, in corporate environments. And there was a particular way that organisations and companies did it. But of course, sometimes actually what we've got to do is got to take a step back. We've got to take a step out. We've got to take a step away from what we've always done to be able to start to compare, to see the difference, to understand actually what I need to do right now, especially in this ever-changing quite complex world is to be able to connect with people so how do most of us lead 
if we've not had any formal training or even if we've had any formal training, then what very often that we do is um, we do what we were taught or we do what actually what our boss did because actually what we did was we got feedback and actually in order to get promoted, we had to adopt a set of behaviors in a particular place for a particular organization. And actually that may or may not work for us. Um, and it may work in that organization, but it may not necessarily work anywhere else. And it may not necessarily work in massive times of change. So there is a little story that I tell, and I tell it quite a lot. So for those of you who've ever heard me speak before, you know, right now, then you've, you will have heard me share this story. And literally there's two little fish and they're swimming round a pond. And there's a big old fish that swing round the other way. And the two little fish see the big old fish and they sort of chuckle a little bit. And the big old fish says to the two little fish, he said, said to them, how's the water this morning? And the two little fish look at each other and they simply go nod and carry on their way. And actually just when they're out of earshot of the big old fish, what they say is, is they turn and look at each other and they simply say, what's water? And of course, if you've never been a fish out of water, you probably don't necessarily know what your water is. In the same way that right now, you're probably not aware of the air that you're breathing, but you would quite quickly pay attention to it if it wasn't there. And so sometimes the way that we lead in some of our leadership behaviours are from an old model of the world. They're from a place that, that doesn't quite fit with where we are now. But they are beliefs that we hold and behaviours that we hold to be so true that actually we don't even question them anymore. And so one of the things that's really good is right now is society, you know, life circumstances, the global pandemic has forced many of us to be a fish out of water. But actually, for the really capable people who want to aspire to achieve great things, they regularly make themselves a fish out of water in order to reflect, to know what works and doesn't work, to be able to pay attention to that stuff that they go, do you know what? I'm not actually sure. Just because I do it, does it actually work for me? And so this is my background. This is where I learned all about leadership or what I thought was leadership, but it was one very specific version. So this literally was the, the, uh, the view from my office window. Um, I used to be uh, an aircraft engineer on a, a Royal Naval Commando Seeking Helicopter Squadron. Uh, and this aircraft, ZA-212 <coughs> uniform, was one of the aircraft on my squadron. And this was literally the view from my office window. Although I have to admit, I didn't take this fabulous photograph. Um, and occasionally there were days when this was the view from my from my office window, which was also a, a really, really cool thing. But it, it taught you a particular way of thinking and a particular way of looking at the world. And I have to admit now, you know, 15, 16 years on is that the lessons I learned from them from then. I can't necessarily use them all today because they were for a particular time in a particular place. But what I can do is really hone in and concentrate on what it taught me. And so this is what I do today. I spend a lot of time in front of large audiences. And whilst I don't necessarily have the size of teams that I used to have, then actually I still see myself as a leader because it's really important for me to be able to help people and share ideas and allow people to think and feel differently in terms of leading them to rec for them to be able to recognize that they can think and feel different things very different things so our leadership behaviors we're just going to chunk down a little bit now and, and look at a level of detail so if we accept the fact that the world is changing and we need to think about leadership differently then what we've got to recognize is there are some leadership behaviors that we've got and some of those behaviors work for us and some of them don't but broadly but broadly within most leadership theory models, then actually what we do is we've got two main types, two main types of leadership behavior. The first type, which is one that lots and lots of organizations are familiar with, and most people think the military is incredibly familiar with, is the ability to be able to provide direction, to give people tasks and stuff and talk about strategy and operational plans and to be able to provide mechanics and metrics and advice and measures of their performance. It is the direction type stuff. It's the stuff that they need to know that is directly related to the business output and the business itself. Um, the other bit is the support, is the human interaction. 
is the human interaction and it's really important that we do that and ever so now and certainly in a VUCA world I'm going to turn on touch on something in a minute when actually this element without making it overly fluffy because there'll be some people that just won't be able to want to respond to that is, is it's really important because actually when we when we inspire people when we connect with people they they don't necessarily do it for the pay rise the the idea the structure the rewards the bonuses all of those things as Hertzberg will tell us they're, they're hygiene factors that are that connect with how we can think about and how we start to recognize that we feel rewarded but at the end of the day people work for people because they like them people work for people who do a truly fabulous job and want to go the extra mile and want to be able to continue being the best version of themselves without you hanging over them is because of the nature of the personal relationship so actually what it is that we need to do is to start to recognize that that right now people have gone through some quite significant change. And, and the Kubler-Ross curve gives us an indication of that. What it says is, is that as the world becomes more complex for people, complex for people, initially they go from a place of shock and denial into then a place of being frustrated with how things are. And I'm sure there are lots of people that you will have known or connected with during lockdown that have been there. They then start to, to get a little bit depressed about how the world or a lack of, you know, a level of low mood because they're now going, oh, my gosh, is this it? Is this where we're stuck? And it's only once we get through that and we start to be able to connect and we'll be able to play. And actually, as we start to be able to play and start to be able to make decisions for ourselves, And actually, as we've moved through lockdown, then one of the things that's been really important for, for people who are leading people and inspiring teams is to allow people to be able to make their own decisions. Because as we allow people to start to make their own decisions about at times about if it's possible, about when they work or how they work about the nature of, of how they go about supporting your organization, what it means then is, is that we give them the ability to be able to lift their morale. We allow them to be able to develop their level of competence in the new place. And what we do at times is by providing less structure is allow them to be able to step up to the plate to really be able to achieve what it is that they need to achieve. So leadership in a VUCA world, in a highly complex world, kind of boils down to this one little bit of theory, really. And it's something called social exchange theory. And I share this a lot with people because it is a pure golden nugget. People only care about what you know when they know how much you care about them. You will all have that, those individuals in your life. You will all have that line manager. You'll all have that leader, that business leader that actually you remember they were someone that invested. You might have not referred to them actually as a leader. You might have referred to them as a mentor, but they were someone that invested in you as a human being. And they took the time to find out about you. And actually in return, what you ended up doing is learning loads from them. Is learning loads from them. And that's social exchange theory. What social exchange theory says really is I won't really engage in what you know until I know that you're safe to be around. Actually, what's the cost to me? Is it time? Is it energy? Is it just feeling frazzled? Because if you've got someone who's constantly bombarding you with statistics and feedback and isn't taking the time to want to build a relationship with you, then actually you, you won't have trust. And what it means is, is that you won't spend any time wanting to build a relationship with them. So trust is key. And social exchange theory fundamentally says is that, that if you want to be able to lead, inspire people, if you want people to be able to be vulnerable, if you want people to go the extra mile and step up to the plate and deliver, they have to know that they can trust you. They have to know that actually what you're going to share with them, their ideas, their energy, their efforts is absolutely and utterly safe in your hands. But what we do know is that every single human being is a completely unique individual. And so the way that I think about, for me personally, the human psyche about us all being individuals is that we've all got a little bit of a map about how our world works. We've all got a little bit of an understanding around how we think the world works for us. And of course, if you've got two people who are working in the same place, could even be working in the same office or in the same department, then chances are, they've got a different map of the same thing. So of course, some people, their map of the world may look a little bit like this. 
And I've just used a map of London to, you know, as an example of that. And some people may have a map of the world that's like this. It's a bit smaller and a bit more detailed. Whereas some people's map of the world is huge and, and very, very, you know, macro in nature. And other people's map of the world is a kind of hybrid between the two. And of course, some people don't necessarily see it at that level. They see it in a completely different way because this is also a map of the same place. And once again, so is this. So one of the things that's really important for us to do in a VUCA environment is to be able to see every single individual that we lead, that we connect with, that we inspire as a unique human, as a unique, unique human being. It causes us to question this idea of consistency. If consistency is doing the same thing to all people, actually some people are gonna be inspired by a pat on the back. Some people may be inspired by a thank you. But actually, if I say thank you to everybody, then I'm probably going to make a difference. And that's a really good thing to be able to do. But what I've got to recognize is the thing that really is going to connect with people is when I say thank you. How do I say thank you? Some people, it's really important for them to be, you know, for you to say thank you publicly, for them to want their efforts to be recognized. And for other people, that isn't the case at all. And just a simple email to say thank you. But how do you know who you get it right for? Well, actually, what we've got to do is build really meaningful relationships with, with the people that we lead, with our teams, to understand which map are they working on. Are they working on this one, this one, or this one? And so what we have to think about now for us as leaders as we step into that place is, is what we believe about ourselves and what we believe about the people that we lead will be the magnet that creates our reality. We have a phrase that we use all the time in coaching. It's called perception is projection. And that's one of those things is I'm currently literally buying a, uh, looking to buy a second hand car for, for my daughter. And someone actually said to me, you know, uh, they've recommended a particular car. They've recommended a Matiz. Now, I had literally up until two days ago and never heard of one. Do you know what? They're everywhere. I haven't absolutely i'm just flabbergasted at the fact that they're everywhere so what we think starts to create our reality and so we need to be able to focus on it so if you're really skeptical about the people you've got working for you and actually that's the lens that you'll end up using that's how you'll end up seeing them we've got to start from a place of being really empowered and likewise you know for those of you that have ever been at the top of a tall building and don't really like heights and someone says to you don't look down what's the first thing you do is you look down so we have to be really mindful about how we share ideas, how we get people to connect with what it is that we want to do. Because all the time we say to someone that they shouldn't do it, then very often we have to think about the thing that we don't want to think about in order not to be able to do it. So in the same way right now, if I go, don't look at my hand, then actually it's really hard not to. It's really hard not to. And so what do we do as leaders? What do we do as individuals, as human beings? And this goes for all of life, really. And this is a great piece of research uh, that came out of Harvard a number of years ago. And for those of you that are familiar with an emotional intelligence type model, then you'll, you'll recognize this. It's something we use as coaches all the time. And what it says is that for us as leaders, we have to recognize that we see the people that we're leading involved in actual events. And depending on that filter, that lens that we apply, then what we do is, is we select the data out that's the most appropriate. Human biology says to us right now that there's about 400 million bits of information that you're currently absorbing as a human being. But actually, most of it, we just disconnect. We just turn off. We, not, we don't focus on. The bits that we focus on are the things that we think are relevant. Actually, at times, our water. So you probably weren't thinking about your right elbow or your left bum cheek or your your right big toe until I mentioned it. And so, suddenly you're now aware of how you're sat on the seat. You're now aware of what you're noticing as you know, you're, you're sat there listening to what I'm saying. So what that means is, is there's massive amounts of information that we could absorb, but we don't. So actually we've got to think really carefully about how I observe the people that I'm leading in this really complex time. What we then do is attach meaning and we attach meaning to what is that we think is going on for them. And actually what that then does is reinforce our beliefs that affects the way that we think about the world. 
So if you've always do what you've always done, then literally you'll end up continually always get what you've always got because you're just reinforcing that thinking. So one of the things that we've got to do right now, especially as people go through a transition and go through change, is want to be inspired by the people that we lead and want to be inspired by the people that lead us to see something different in them, to give them a chance to recognize that in this complex environment, they can show up and be different. Because otherwise you literally will never see the wood for the trees. And as soon as I mentioned trees, you can see loads of them. But actually you probably didn't notice the lady walking the two dogs in the, towards the bottom left-hand corner until I mention it. And now, you know, there'll be some of you looking at the screen going, oh yeah, and I hadn't seen that initially. And so it's really important how we encourage the people that we lead right now to think. How we speak to ourselves simply changes everything. Our thoughts can make a difference in terms of who we are. And actually one of our jobs as leaders is to encourage people to have a really powerful narrative around themselves. Because essentially we tell two types of stories around ourselves. We tell stories around, I can't, we you know it won't work we've done it before we can't do it again or do we tell achievement stories do we tell stories that allow us to go do you know what that didn't work last time but actually that was a different group of people it was a different time you know we've all changed we've grown and it's really important that as we lead people in a VUCA environment as the world around them starts to become more complex then actually what we've got to do is encourage people to tell achievement stories and that's not necessarily looking through the world, you know, with rose tinted spectacles, but it is encouraging people to think about actually, how am I acknowledging the really great things that the people working for me are doing? And if you don't think there's a lot, then we've got to plant a seed to start to let it grow. The don'ts, the shouldn'ts. You know, there is a, a bit of an adage that, that comes from uh, a, a parenting theory that on average for most of us we say we say seven don'ts to a to one do to uh to um to the young people in our lives um and actually what we find is that that's very often echoed in in how we lead and connect with people is that yes we can do the big presentations we can do the big empowerment speeches that maybe we do the professional development reviews in really good order but our general conversation are we encouraging people to be the best version of themselves because actually for the people we lead then that allows them ultimately to make choices because if we're not allowing the people that we lead to be able to simply make their own choices around how they want to be, then what we slowly do is just turn everybody into minions and people end up only then doing exactly what it is that they have been told. So what we need to think about is that, that your attitude towards the people that you lead affects the way that you behave. And that the, therefore then what they do is they pay attention to your behavior. And actually that will then affect their attitude towards you as a leader, which will affect the way that they behave. And it becomes that ever, and it can be an ever expanding cycle or it can become an ever decreasing cycle. One of the things that is the most important is that if it's an ever decreasing cycle, someone has to break the cycle. And as the environment that we're part of can become more complex, actually it's our job, it's my job as a leader, as a thought leader to be able to go, do you know what? I need to break the cycle. So if I want people to think and feel differently about what it is they do and how they show up and how they want to be able to perform in the world, then what it is that I need to do is to be able to put a stop somewhere and be able to try and turn that to make it ever expanding, to be able to tell those stories, to plant those seeds, to show people that actually right now, do you know what? They can, rather than thinking they can't. And of course, as Aristotle says to us, we are what we repeatedly do. It's not what we say we do, it's what we do. So if we want to be someone who inspires people to lead right now, then actually what we've got to do is encourage them to be able to show up. We need to connect with them being the best version of themselves and actually need to put a bit of a fanfare around that. Because actually, if they do that, then actually they'll end up doing more of that. 
you know as well as I do that what we tend to do is respond to the feedback from the people that lead us and if we constantly say stop and don't eventually people just stop and don't going the extra mile whereas when we get excited and identify the things that they can do and the things that the contribution that we want them to make then that's when we really step into a fabulous place with them. As Peter Drucker said, for those of you who have spent some time in the world of management and leadership education, for those of you on the call right now on the webinar who maybe have studied an MBA or, or, or a business studies degree, then you'll know all about the famous Peter Drucker. Um, the greatest danger in our times is that, that, that the turbulence that exists, and certainly the turbulence that exists outside the organization, allows us to, to seek and to engage in an opportunity for change. But the problem very often is that the world will change and the world will change around us and that everybody is trying to use yesterday's logic to try and solve today's problems, as opposed to stepping into the unknown, as opposed to embracing the ambiguity and the uncertainty and recognizing that actually, do you know what? No matter how complex the world gets, if you and I actually have a meaningful relationship, we can actually explore this and work out how we can actually engage and support and deal with this together. And so as all of that occurs, then actually what we need to do is want to create new logic as a leader rather than simply recreating the behaviors <coughs> of whatever it is that we learn. So it is about going on a brave new journey. It is about thinking in a different way. It's not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's taking with us all that stuff that we know around coaching, around how to build relationships with people. But it's about investing in those relationships with people because the challenges that any organization face typically will be met, although there will be data and finance and statistics and all those things, but it will be met by the people in the organization as they meld their ideas together. So ultimately it's about relationships and relationships are going to be the key. So the more that we invest in the relationships with the people that we lead, the more that we can inspire them, the more that we can encourage them to be the best version of themselves. So actually what we get to do is to, to look at the world of leading in a slightly different way. So that draws me to a conclusion. I've got some time for, for questions for those of you that are there. So I'll just close the screen. Um, what I will do for those of you that want to connect on LinkedIn, then please feel free to, to do so. Um, what I've also done is I've also put together a little three part course uh, around this. So um, I will get Matt or myself will email out to you the, the link for that. For those of you that just want some free resource and want to be able to share it with your teams right now. So I'm just going to click the question tab to see if anybody's actually, um, if there uh, are any questions. So there are no questions. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a not so good thing. But if you've got a question, then, then you know, please feel free to, to, to share it right now. Um, uh, if you don't, then... Uh, so the one question is, is that, uh, that someone's asked um, and said, Ian, I was taking notes. Um, does this mean that, um, that, that I see it's recording? Is the recording is available? So uh, fortunately enough, I haven't set it to record. It's just recorded. Um, it's recorded automatically. So uh, what I can do is I will... Um, once I chop the bit off at the front and, and possibly chop whatever bit off at the back when I go into Zoom later. And what I can do is I'll upload it to YouTube as an unlisted video and, um, and I will send you the link. So hopefully that will be, uh, that will be okay. Uh, so Angelo, I'm going to answer your question right now, if that's, if, if that's okay. Um, uh, I like leading by example. However, how do you promote and engage <coughs> uh, a lazy team member? Well, well, actually, um, one of the things that's really interesting is, um, is uh, and, and I'm mindful of what I say right now, Angelo, because we can't necessarily enter into a, a meaningful discussion about it, but sometimes is lazy according to who? Um, is that lazy according to them or is that lazy according to you? Um, and, and one of the things that very often is, is people's understanding and expectation of, of what it is that, uh, that they're required to do. 
Um, one of the things that so there's, there's one of the clients that I work with, they have a really powerful model of team and they talk about the idea of people uh, working together to achieve a common goal. And, and that tends to be quite a, a, a really standard definition of a team for lots of people. Um, unfortunately, uh, that could also be a group. It could be a collective. It could be a rabble. It could also be a gang. And so the big difference that very often with a team is where people are, are able to hold each other mutually accountable. You know, one of the things that unfortunately we all learn at school is you, you don't, you know, you don't tell tales and you don't dob anyone in. So what that tends to happen is, is that well, how does that migrate for us as, as adults? Then very often what happens is, is that we have a reluctance to have some really detailed, meaningful conversations with some of our team members to be able to possibly turn around and say, do you know what? I'm not entirely sure that you've pulled your weight today. And so one of the things that's really important for us is our ability to be able to have those conversations meaningfully. And so for those of you that are familiar with, you know, what is an old piece of theory these days, which is the Tuckman cycle, which is the, the forming, the storming, the norming and performing, then very often what happens is we form a team and then everybody wants to quickly brush over the storming bit, they get to the norming bit. And actually what we haven't got is any mechanisms to be able to have those really meaningful conversations around, how do I tell you, I don't think you're pulling your weight. How do you tell me if I'm failing you as a leader? And what are the mechanisms? So in the storming phase, it's really important that we spend some time investing in, in working out how we're going to agree to agree, how we're going to hold each other mutually accountable. And when we get a new team member in, then actually it's really important that we do that. And so what it means is, is that we need to be able to initially have those conversations around, actually, this is how I perceive your behaviours, you know, and how do you perceive your behaviours? And to be able to have a meaningful conversation uh, around that. And that's a start. And that's a start. But very often people are lazy because, A, they choose to be but normally because they can get away with it. And so very often it's that relationship with working out, um, you know, how is this person motivated? How are we going to connect with them? How are we going to have a meaningful conversation to explore what is it that they truly want? Um, so happy to continue that, that conversation, Angelo, at, uh, at some other time, but they would be my, my thoughts right now. Um, Lisa, you have said... Uh, what would be one thing that you would strongly recommend as a leader and manager did at this time? Um, I suppose one action would be, uh, what, what's the one action that you'd want to take us away from our webinar? Well, I'm going to give you three, actually. Um, one is, is to think about and reflect on what's your water. You know, uh, uh, take some time to think about what are the things that you hold currently to be so true about the way that you lead people um, that you just take it for granted and, and don't even realize whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. So some personal reflection. Um, the other bit, the big bit, uh, Lisa, is about the social exchange theory, is literally people will not trust you until they know that you care. Now, I'm an ex-serviceman, so there are people in my life that I've trusted implicitly and put my life in their hands and they put, my, put theirs in mine but I wouldn't trust them to babysit and I wouldn't trust them necessarily to take my dog for a walk. Um, so trust has to be contextual. And what it then means is that people are, when they're vulnerable and, and trust you, they'll do it within the context. So really right now, investing some, some time in people's relationships. Um, and it could be just around some simple questions, you know, actually for the team that you lead right now to ask them all individually is, you know, so what are the five best things that have occurred right now? you know, or what's occurred in the last four or five months that actually we should keep, we should definitely keep in the way that we work moving forward. And what's the top five things that we should definitely change. Now, it, it may be that those things that are definitely we should keep, you may not be able to, but what it means is at least you know that they're important to those people. So you get to do uh, some, you know, pre, proper pre, pre, PR around it as you make and influence those changes. And what it means then is that you get to, to be able to manage your expectation and their expectation of what it is that you can and can't achieve. Very often on the things that need to change, then there'll be a couple of quick wins very often because people tend to very often make the most noise right now about the thorns in their side. 
people will do one or two things when you ask them about the five things that you want to change. They'll either catastrophize and give you these huge amount of things, you know, I just want the world to go back to normal. Well, actually, you know, if they've answered the question first with what are the five things that you'd like to keep as a result of working this way, then they probably don't mean that they want to go back to how it was. Um, or there'll be some simple stuff like I could just do with another monitor at home, you know, for a hundred pounds. Can the company not buy me one off Amazon? Because it would make my dining room a little bit easier as an office. Or do you know what? I've, I'm starting with RSI. Actually, can I have a Bluetooth headset? So it's just simply to <clears throat> to ask those questions. So the first thing is is to reflect. The second thing is <clears throat> is to think about social exchange theory. Um, the third bit is without doing some kind of, you know, necessarily quiz thing or whatever it is that, that people are fed up with, but it's to think about actually, how do I create, you know, how do I create some social moments to facilitate my team still being able to connect with each other in order to be able to create some opportunities for them to be able to provide some mutual support. Uh, and one of the things that lots of organizations have seen now, whilst there used to be lots of interconnectivity from, from, from team members as they could work together, is that as a, as a line manager, a leader in a business, and actually as some of those social cohesive bonds have started to break down, is, is that everything started to go up. So the sheer volume of, of, of stuff that, that previously didn't need to involve you uh, is now involving you. So it would be ensure that your, your, your people can connect with each other. Think about how you invest in your relationships with them, whether that be emotionally or practically, and, and do a little bit of reflection. What is it you've learned? You know, what are your, you know, what are your holy grails? What are your beliefs that you hold to be true that actually maybe it, it's time to explore differently? Um, and the one thing that this lockdown has done for us is, is it's given us a direct comparison with what used to happen and with what is currently happening now. And so sometimes it's quite easy because we've all been a fish out of water during this time to think about what it is that we'd like to be different. So I hope that answers your, your question, Lisa. Um, uh, cool. And, you know, feel free, ask. Um, I will uh, send you all, once I've worked out how to, to do it and, or I've got Matt to do it, we'll, um, I'll send you all out a link once I've edited the, uh, the video so you've got the ability to, to watch it again. Um, if you've got any questions and you want to ask them privately, then please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or email me. Um, and like I say, I, um, I'm going to share with you a little, it's called The Best You. Um, I'll share with you a little three-part leadership development program right now. And actually, it's for you. Feel free, share it with your team. It just talks people through understanding, actually, how do they show up right now? What qualities do they want to focus on? And how do they want to grow? Um, so share it with as, as, as many or as fewer people as you want. And, um, and as they say in nautical circles, um, and I'll, I'll take a quote from my former life right now. Um, I will see you all again when the fog lifts. So thank you. Goodbye. And I'll leave you to the rest of your afternoon.